our final talk today before we go into a group uh, discussion session is by uh, Marit De Witt. Uh, Marit's, um, a, again, someone with multiple talents, as most people who work for MSF are. She's an academic, public health person, and a medical doctor. So, Marit, you're talking, I think, on behalf of a group of people, yes. and therefore she's got 15 minutes to talk, and then we'll go straight into the panel session. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody, and welcome online people. Thank you for listening. Uh, what I, the title of, this, of the talk I'm going to do is a bit presumptive. It's about the rise in malaria and what is causing the rise, and I will not have a definite answer for you. Uh, just for those of you who are not familiar with the context, the Democratic Republic in Congo uh, is in the heart of Africa, and it's been plagued by violence and conflicts at least for over the last two decades. In 2014, the UNDP um, ranked DRC 186 out of 187 countries on the Human Development uh, Index, and it scored lowest on under five mortality and on life expectancy at birth. For those of you who are not familiar with malaria, <laughs> I didn't know I was the last one in the row, but just to go quickly through it, you probably all know it. Um, malaria is caused by a parasite that is transmitted by a certain type of mosquitoes. Um, it can quickly develop into severe malaria, and that is usually deadly if left untreated. Um, there is effective treatment for, for uncomplicated malaria in the form of artemisinin combination therapy. So a combination of artemisinin with a partner drug, um, and that is a very effective therapy in principle. Um, and also we have long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets, which have LLIN, which will come back in the talk. And they used to protect uh, against the mosquito bites when you're sleeping under them. Oops. Um, so all MSF sections are working in Congo, and we're mostly f all our projects are mainly focused in the east and in the north of the country, uh, where most of the violence and the conflict is going around. Um, in OCA, uh, since 2009, we've seen a really steady rise in malaria cases that we see um, in our project. And the graph you see here is actually just getting our stable projects, just the three stable projects that we have in North Kivu, South Kivu, and Katanga. So the, this graph does not represent any of the outbreak responses we've done. But what you can see is that we have a huge rise in cases in our stable projects. Um, and in 2010-11, um, as a group, we sat together and say this is getting out of control and we must try to find what is causing this rise in the outbreak. So we sat together with a group of people um, and actually looked at what we could look at in our settings. So we came up with four studies that we try, hoped would give us an answer to why this rise was happening. One of the questions was, is there any changes in the adherence to the drugs that we give to people? So the ACT combination that we give in Congo um, is artisanate amodioquine, or abbreviated as AZAC. Uh, and would there be any change if people don't take their drugs that might cause a rise in malaria cases? The other, drug, the other thing that we wanted to look at is, is the actual drug that we're giving, is that still an effective drug? So is AZAC actually effective? Um, and then we said, well, if it isn't, what are we going to propose as an alternative to the government? So we therefore also looked at another drug that is commonly used, which is arthemetolumifantrin, or most of you know it as coartem. The next thing we thought we were going to look at is see what the knowledge and attitude of people in the region is to the bed nets. Do, do they know what is causing malaria? Do they associate malaria with mosquitoes? Do they use the nets? Do they use them well? How old are the nets, etc.? And the third and la the fourth and last one was something a very new enterprise for all of us in MSF was actually looking at the mosquito. What are the mosquitoes that are flying around? Have they changed their behaviour? Are they getting resistant to the insecticides that are on the net? So I'm privileged to present the results of all four of these studies, uh, of which I am only the principal investigator of one of them. So the first study we've done, and this the credit goes to Ruby uh, Sudiki from the Manson unit, who was the PI of this study. She has looked at adherence in Katanga. Um, there was ERB approval given by MSF and agreement from the Ministry of Health. So the objective of the study was to measure the adherence to first-line treatment. And what we did in, um, in the Katanga clinic was, first of all, systematic sampling of people who were diagnosed with uncomplicated malaria and who actually were given a three-day treatment. 
And the team, after systematic sampling, visited the families in their homes on the next day. So if you'd count the first dose that was given in the clinic as day zero, then day one and two were taken at home, and then on day three, the team would visit the people in their home. And this was adults and children alike. They asked for consent when they actually knocked on the door and said, can we ask you certain questions? And they asked people questions about the malaria drugs that they got, and they, were, they asked to see the blister in which the tablet should have been. Then there were certain, you know, you could fall into certain categories. There were certain non-adherent people. That were people who could show you the blister with tablets left in there. Like we knew for sure they would not have taken them correctly or not have finished the course. Then there were people who either could not show the blister or who actually shown an empty blister, but then had a story of said, yeah, I gave, you know, I gave one to my first kid, one to my second kid, and one to the third. And then we suspected they were not very adherent. Um, <laughs> Then there were people who had a good story and had shown either, you know, showed us an empty blister or could not show the blister, but we had really good reasons to believe they were adherent. Now, if you look at the results, so there's 108 people that we ended up um, visiting, um, and so certain non adherent was six of them, probably non adherent 35, and probably adherent 67. If you take the probably non-adherent to be non-adherent, this is the result that we came up with. So 62% of the people that we visited um, were adherent to the treatment, or probably adherent, um, and that is very much alike any survey we've done previously in other countries. In We did it, for example, in Sierra Leone, in Central African Republic, and it's very alike what we do in the Western world for antibiotics if you ask people if they've finished their course. So we have no reasons to believe that this could have a relation with the rise of malaria. Um, if you take this study a bit further and you exclude people who have vomited or spat out the pills, um, the actual adherence is a bit lower, but also in line with results from other studies we have. The reasons for adherent behavior was mostly that correct instructions were given. Most common reasons for non-adherence were that people vomited or felt unwell, which is a very common side effect from art uh, artisanate amodioquine, uh, and perhaps the poor understanding of it. This part is a bit tricky because some people gave answers uh, not matching, like if they were non-adherent, they gave reasons why they were adherent. So that was a bit difficult to, to assess. So the second study of which I was a PI, um, what we did is we looked at the efficacy of the artemisinin and amodioquine and compared that to coartem. Um, the inclusion criteria for this study were any children between half a year and, and five years, so children under five years of age, who were diagnosed with uncomplicated malaria without any other infection, so without co-infection, and also people who had not taken uh, an anti-malarial drug in the past 28 days. Um, what you see is that we assessed 873 children and we excluded 585. Um, we, to, in order to get to our sample size, required sample size, we needed 144 kids in both arms, um, accounting for loss to follow up and withdrawals. Um, the reasons for this huge number to be excluded was actually mostly that people had taken um, an ACT combination from a pharmacy, a local pharmacy, or anything in the previous 28 days. Um, and the reason, uh, the other reason were co-infections. So a lot of these kids came with malaria, but actually had a co-infection. So what were the results of the study? And I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with reading these graphs, but what you can see here is timeline as it goes past. And this is actually percentage or the proportion. So the blue line here significant is the children with Azak, and the other one is the children with Coartem. And what you can see that in the first like 20, 21 days, the first three weeks, both treatments work really, really well. And then you can see a drop. That means that children who were followed up, we followed them up weekly um, and assessed their, we did a slide to see if they had parasites. Um, you can see that children start having failures, that means that they start having parasites in their blood. Either they were sick with malaria or they didn't feel anything but they had parasites on their slides. And you can see this proportion increase over time. We followed them up for 42 days, so six weeks. 
Now, this could mean two things. Either people get reinfected. They live in a highly endemic malaria setting, so they could be treat well treated, and then a couple of weeks later, they could be reinfected with malaria. They could be stung again and get malaria again. Or it could be, and that was actually what we were looking for, it could be that the drugs didn't work, that they killed some of the parasites, but not all, and they would come back. So what we did, we, all these kids, we had blood, dried blood spot samples for them. We analyzed them in the lab in, in Amsterdam, and we looked whether it was a reinfection or recrudescence. And it appeared that only seven children of the 288 children had a recrudescence. So the vast majority were actually reinfections, and only seven children, one in the AL group and one in the uh, six in the Azak group, had a recrudescence. The difference here is not significant, and it actually gets down to an efficacy of the treatment of 95% for, for Azak and 99 for Coartem, both which are very good. Interesting are, uh, so both of them are effective. If intake is taken correct, we did observed in intake of the drug, so we are sure that that is not a bias. Um, but the high rate of reinfection, in fact, overall 13% of the children got reinfected within six weeks. But in the peak season from October to December, 30% of the children got a new malaria infection within six weeks. So you treat them, and six weeks later, a third still has a new infection. And there was an incredibly high rate of co-infections, which I think is no surprise to people working, but it, is, it was a surprise to see it like this. The third study we did to, to look at the rise was a CAP survey done by Ruby Siddiqui again as principal investigator. So we did this in all three provinces where we worked, and we, the objective was to see what the knowledge and attitude towards insecticide-treated NEDs were. It was done by a two-stage cluster sampling where the household was the sample unit. Um, and we looked um, at, first of all, a universal coverage of bed nets, which is actually one bed net per two household members, which sounds like a... If you have one net per two household members, you assume that everybody can sleep under it. If we look what we found there, nobody achieved universal coverage, and it was incredibly low at the universal, like in Katanga, the coverage for universal coverage was incredibly low. Actually, South Kivu did relatively well. And noticeably, 38% of people in Katanga had no bed net at all, so they couldn't sleep under one. Individual coverage, which actually meant, like, we asked people, did you sleep under a bed net yesterday night, last night? Um, the, the, no, the norm were the same, but it was higher. So about 60% in North Kivu, 80% in South Kivu, but only 38% um, in Katanga slept under a bed net last night. And of those nets, we know that the bed nets in Katanga, actually, uh, were really bad. So we define a good net as being less than three years old and having l few or no holes in them. Um, and they hang correctly. And that was very low in Katanga. So uh, North and South Kivu slept under good net, good condition net, but the opposite was true in Katanga. So those people who had a net in Katanga slept under a net of bad conditions. And then the vector study. So what we did in Katanga, in, in, in the south of the country, um, we sent out a team to collect mosquitoes. So they caught 2,500 mosquitoes with different means. So we had light traps to, to trap mosquitoes. We had pyrethrin spray collection and indoor resting um, collection of mosquitoes. Um, and we analyzed what are the mosquitoes that are flying around. And then when you look at this graph here, you can see what species. So this is all Anopheles, and these are subspecies. And what we can say from this is Funestes and Gambier are the very classical mosquito, ma malaria mosquitoes. So they do bite between dusk and dawn. They do like to sit inside. They, you know, so they are the perfect targets for bed nets. Then we looked at how many of those mosquitoes were actually infected with malaria, plas with a plasmodium parasite. That was about 1.8%, which is considered normal for high endemic settings. Where were they caught? So this is a map of Shamwana, the, the place in Katanga. And you can see here that green dots represent houses where we did not catch malaria-positive mosquitoes. And the bigger the dots get, the more 
mosquitoes in one household were infected, so up to four. And what you can't see here, but what is it? There's a river here. So you can see that actually where, it's not random in the village that these mosquitoes fly around and then you have malaria. It's actually quite localized. So even in a highly affected village, there are hot spots in households. Then those mosquitoes, so the locally caught mosquitoes, we subjected them to four different concentrations of known mosquito insecticides. The bottom two here are the insecticides used in bed nets. DDT, you all know, and bendiocarp is, is a, an, an agent that we use to, to do indoor residual spraying with. What you can see here at the bottom, so this was an hour they were subjected to these insecticides, and actually, the idea is that a mosquito would hit the insecticide and they would literally be knocked down, as in a boxing match, so they would just fall down. Um, and actually with these two, so permethrin and deltametrine, they didn't do that very well. So a lot of them were not knocked down. And the other two were okay. So there's a marked difference between insecticides. Now, there is a, a genetic mutation that can cause a resistance to this knockdown mechanism. It's called the knockdown resistant mutation, KDR. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a first, so you're a first audience to see this, because the, the mosquitoes, the Gambier mosquitoes that we caught um, in Katanga, none of them were completely susceptible to this knockdown thing eh, anymore. Most of them were partly resistant, but there was a high resistance, like the genetic mutation was present in more than half of the mosquitoes to actually be knocked down by the insecticide of the bed nets. And that is something we didn't know and I don't think anybody knows because Congo is a black hole when it comes to malaria research. And then what else did we do? We brought home nets from people in Katanga. So we asked people in Katanga, can we have your net? We'll give you a new one, but can we just take your net? Randomly, we just grab nets from, well, we asked, but from people's nets to take them home. <laughs> Those nets, five from each brand, so there are four different type nets circling in, in Katanga, distributed by us, by UNICEF, by other NGOs, called Duranet, Net Protect, Oliset, and Permanet. They're all WHO approved nets, um, and we took them home. And we had no idea how old they were, how, how much they were washed, whatever, but this was real life. Um, Janine Lonen, who is the PI of this study, actually made a cardboard thing and put these nets on um, and subjected per cone, as you can see here. So there's a cone that is strapped here on that net from the field and released five mosquitoes into each of these nets and quickly plugged the hole and then waited to see how many would be knocked down, step one, and then after 24 hours, how many of them were killed. To have a comparison, we also had a control net which was not impregnated at all. So what you can see from this field, from this test, so these are bed nets from the field with fresh mosquitoes, susceptible mosquitoes, that within the nets, there is a huge difference between the percentage of dead mosquitoes, so that is within the net, and also between the nets. But the striking feature, what you see here, for example, is that this net, which is impregnated with permethrene, actually none of the mosquitoes get killed, or at least they have completely the same results as the untreated nets. This is an unlucky mosquito that banged his head <laughs> in the net <laughs> for no reason at all. Um, but Oli said is doing the same thing. And that could be because Oli said has been distributed for like five years ago. We don't know. It might not have nothing to do with the brand, but it could have really have to do with permethrene. And the same actually here for the delta metrine. So some worked really well, but a lot of them did not work well. So what we can say for overall conclusions, um, there is an important rise in malaria cases seen without any program changes. And we think now after these studies that this cannot be explained by adherence or efficacy of the, of the drugs. So the adherence seems no difference in Katanga than anywhere else. And in South Kivu, Azak and AL are very effective drugs if they're taken as instructed. But the bed nets and the insecticide um, resistance, the, the mosquito resistance to the insecticides needs further study. 
Um, the bed net coverage is certainly not universal, and there's substantial differences between the regions which should not, they, they, there's no reason for them to be there. And then local mosquitoes showed reduced susceptibility to key insecticides currently used on the net, and that is a very important factor for if we want to distribute nets again in the future. There are other things that we found as side effects or secondary outcomes of these studies, and one is that we know very little about the environment and the environmental changes. Also, the behavior changes of people, behavioral changes of people towards nets and things, what can we improve there and towards adherence? Uh, but also, what is the attributable factor of malaria to actually the sick kids that we see? In the efficacy study, for example, we saw that all kids that had a positive, many kids that had a positive RDT actually had a co-infection. Now, do they have malaria or do they have another disease with a positive test because they, they live there? So those things need further investigation, and we're really happy and keen to take up the challenge to do that. The acknowledgement list is only from people from HQ and high up people in Congo, but I'd like to thank every, all the mothers and all the children that participated and all the field study teams which could have filled another 20 slides. Thank you very much. Thank you.